So in this video, I want to talk about whether artificial intelligence or super intelligence poses a real threat to human humanity. So is AI dangerous? And I am very excited. I'm here with Nick Bostrom. Nick is a professor here at Oxford University. Um, I've just visited you here at the Future of Humanity, um, the Future of Humanity Institute, which you founded. And um, you've written a, a very influential book on, on, on the topic called Super Intelligence, which I enjoyed. This was published in 2014. That's right. So uh, quite a while ago. Yeah. Um, maybe your thinking has moved on. Maybe you can give me your view on how existential a threat of super, super intelligence really is to, to humankind. Well, so I should say that although the book um, focused a lot on what could go wrong, um, I also think there is this enormous upside. It's just that at the time when I was writing the book, there was some neglect of certain uh, issues. So mm. I thought it was important to address that. Um, since 2014, of course, progress has been very rapid in machine learning, the whole deep learning revolution has really made AI something that is now in the public discourse as a sort of, everybody's talking about it. All governments have some sort of strategy roadmap or something. Absolutely. Um, so it's five years, but a lot has changed, uh, especially in terms of the, uh, the wider societal thinking around some of these issues. Mm. So in, in your book, you talk about AI as being a little bit like children playing with a bomb um, that could, could go off at any point in time. Do you still feel like that? Well, in some sense, with regard to other really powerful technologies as well, I think that there is a mismatch between our level of maturity in terms of our wisdom, our ability to cooperate as a species on the one hand, mm. and on the other hand, our uh, instrumental ability to uh, use technology to make big changes in the world. And it seems yes. like we've grown stronger, faster than we've grown wiser recently. And Very so fun. in some sense we are, I don't know, may, maybe not, not like toddlers, but uh, say uh, teenagers who, who suddenly have adult levels of muscular power, but maybe not yet the judgment to go with it. So how should we use AI in, in a good way then? Well, so there are two different contexts here. So the book focused on this hypothetical future point where you get AIs with the same general intelligence that we have, the same general learning ability, planning ability. And, so, mm -hmm. and then as I argued shortly thereafter, it's super intelligence. And so that's one context. I, I think it's really important, even though it might be quite much further down the road because it would be so consequential. Mm -hmm. But then there is uh, another context, which is the here and now, all kinds of exciting AI tools and applications um, that are beginning to affect the economy in many different ways, uh, which is also a very you know, serious and legitimate thing to be thinking about. But confusion often arises when, when they start to fuse into one thing, then you get this AI blob, like a simultaneous um, overhyping of what's possible now and, and maybe an underhyping of what will eventually become possible. Yeah, and we've seen this for a long time in the AI space, that uh, people have maybe overhyped things, but actually in the long run, we've seen massive changes. And so do, do you still see super intelligence as a accident, as, as, as a, a real threat to you? Yeah, well, so I like to say that um, I think of it as a kind of portal through which um, all the really great trajectories to a fantastic future will have to uh, passage at some mm -hmm. stage or another. So I think that there will be risks associated with this transition to machine mm. intelligence era, including, I think, some existential risks. Mm. Um, nevertheless, it would be a mistake to try to somehow avoid developing it, and our focus should be on putting ourselves in the best possible position so that mm. when when all the pieces of the technology fall into place, we've, we've done our homework, we've developed uh, scalable AI control methods, we've thought hard about the ethics and the governance, and et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, and then, then proceed forward and then hopefully have an extremely good outcome from that. That's, that's my kind of um, 10,000 level uh, that, that, overview. That, that's yeah. exactly what I hope is going to happen. Right. And some of the, the books that I'm writing, this is the message I'm sending out, that we need to use the superpower that we now have in our fingertips 
in our hands to actually solve some of the biggest problems and challenges we face as mm -hmm. humans. But then we also have lethal weapons that that are controlled by AI. So how right. do we get the balance right between this? Well, I mean, again, yeah, uh, I, 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 as a first preliminary to the analysis, I, can, I would like to distinguish these different contexts and the different stages along the timeline. Yeah. Um, and then if we look, say, at present or very near term capabilities that I mean, AI is not this like thing that will affect one thing. It's like a general purpose technology and, and it's, you know, whether it's for entertainment or medicine or logistics, uh, increasingly scientific research, like you, you name it, like you yeah. can find some, wherever human intelligence is useful, probably AI could be useful as well. Um, so, so that makes it very hard to say something short and pithy that kind of captures all of these different impacts and all of the issues that will arise. Um, I think some, if, if, one, if, if one is thinking about systemic effects that might sort of change society in some general way, mm. um, I'm par might be particularly interested in how it would interact with our global information systems um, that then affects political dynamics and so forth. So say we have developments in the ability to conduct surveillance and analyze surveillance data and, um, whether it is through cameras or, or, or mining um, social uh, network communication, then build up more detailed profiles of each person and user, um, their hot buttons, their habits, their patterns. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if you're able to harness all of that and then maybe train AI to kind of shape that in some way like that, I mean, that, that could be quite powerful for, for good and for ill, right? Absolutely. Um, um, autonomous weapons have received a lot of attention, and I mean that's a complicated uh, issue all in its own right. And and but then just this kind of general uh, tide as a kind of a flood lifting all boats, like a lot of little processes just becoming a little bit more efficient. Mm -hmm. so, so suppose you run a big um, warehouse for textile garments that you then ship out, right? So if you can predict future demand curves slightly more accurately using some AI tool, right? Maybe you can have 5% less inventory and you save a little money. And that, if you add all of that up across the economy, right? It, it becomes a general contributor yeah. to mm -hmm. productivity. Absolutely. So what are, how, how can we as humans then prepare for this? How can businesses and leaders, what, what do they need to do or think about in order to use AI for good and not fall into the trap of creating some sort of super intelligence that can destroy humanity? Well, I mean, I don't think you'd uh, fall into the trap of creating some super intelligence by accident if you are going about running your business. I think that's uh, one of the less likely scenarios in which you would have a detrimental effect on the world. I mean, it's hard, right? There are like research teams with thousands of people trying uh, their their darndest for a year in and year out to try to make this happen. It's not going to happen, you know, while while you are selling your window cleaning your chemicals <laughs> or something. Um, um, now, I think t to offer some useful advice, I think you would want to be a little bit more granular. You want to look what what precisely is the sector, what is the business, and then the answer how they might use AI would differ depending on the particular circumstances. If you look at companies like Facebook and Google who invest huge <clears> amounts <throat> of money into AI yeah. research, and then also some Chinese companies are doing the same. They're also yeah. linked to the state, which then many people have concerns about how you use this for surveillance, how you could potentially use this for weapons. And I, I think the boundaries are blurring between businesses and, and, and governments and how we can use this technology. Yeah, I mean, so, so in a practical way, obviously if you're Google or Facebook, then there's like any number of uses of AI. I mean, if you're Google, you're basically an AI company. That's kind of, most of what you do from the search engine, mm -hmm. right? But even running your server farms, uh, you can, it turns out, uh, make energy savings by optimizing the, the, the fan speeds and so forth with the reinforcement learning algorithm. Absolutely. Um, um, recognizing photos and, you know, mm -hmm. malware intrusion detection, like all of these things. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, now, um, in terms of your, ethical and social responsibilities. You're, you're in an interesting place because at that scale, if you're a Google or Facebook, you're not just one more little actor in a perfectly competitive economy 
like as, as if you're like a, a, a dry cleaner or something, right? Do you actually have market power? Um, and millions, or in some cases, billions of people's lives can be affected by choices you make in, in your algorithms, like which web pages should be promoted up mm. the Google search engine, or if you're mm. Facebook, like which things should appear. Mm. And these things can have a big impact. Mm. So that places you in this weird position. You're a private company, but in some ways, you're also a government over a large digital realm. Mm. Um, and that's quite a lot of power. I feel in some cases, I think these companies might have wished they didn't have so much power. Like mm. think their Facebook is like a really tricky thing to know. I mean, there's no choice you can make that will not have the result that a lot of other people will be really angry with you. Mm. Right? Whatever you do, somebody's going to hate you. <laughs> yeah, um, and then think there are all these different countries and different cultures mm. and different political views and, and you're just kind of finding yourself right at the spot where this giant tug of war is happening. And so um, I wouldn't be surprised if, 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 if Mark Zuckerberg had the ability to just outsource a lot of these judgments, say, about the criteria for which news items are legit or, or which ads are fraudulent and so mm. forth, that that would be like a big burden off of his shoulder. Um, and um, but but similarly, then uh, also an attractive target for whoever wants to try to like claim the, the the information high ground as a kind of powerful position in the mimetic space, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to kind of exert a lot of influence in the world, Absolutely. these these would be like points of interest for governments and other actors. So, if you were to summarize some of the the biggest threats you see around. What would you say are some of the? Well, if we need to talk specifically about the threats, I think the biggest one would be this longer term uh, problem of uh, introducing something radically super intelligent, but then possibly failing to align it um, with human values and intentions. This this is like a big technical problem that people are working on, mm. um, and so that we would sort of succeed at solving the capability problem before we succeed at solving the, the safety and alignment problem. Yes, yeah, so the, the super intelligence would basically leave us behind. That, so that, that would be one big, and, and the other maybe, I don't know, similarly important risk. I'm not sure whether it's slightly above or below, but uh, it would then be the, the, the question of how we would use this extremely powerful technology. Um, mm -hmm. We as humans not being one coordinated wise, benevolent world actor, but competing mm -hmm. powers mm -hmm. that if you look at the history of technology, you, you find that pretty much every technology has also been used for waging wars and in many cases as tools of oppression and so mm -hmm. forth. And so there's then this question of which kind of use will, will predominate. If it's going to be used for all kinds of things, will kind of the good uses um, outweigh the bad uses? Absolutely. Um, and that is not a technical problem but the political problem but but one i think is also very important and serious so do, do you stand on the the positive and the the optimistic side or more on the pessimistic side you could say i'm a i a, a frightened optimist yeah. um or a fretful optimist <laughs> yeah um so yeah i i uh, i mean i i I, I am very excited about what it could do if we get it right. Mm. Uh, I think the near-term effects are just overwhelmingly positive. Mm. And the longer-term effect, I think it's still more of an open question uh, and uh, it's very hard to predict. But the more we do our, our homework, the more we get our act together as a world and as a species in whatever number of years or decades or sometimes say centuries, I doubt it's that long. But however much time we have available, like the, 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 the the, the better we are prepared for this, um, I think the better the odds of, of a favorable outcome, which in that case could be extremely favorable. Very good. This is a nice positive way right. to, yeah. to end. Let's end positive. Thank you very much, Nate. Thank you. Thank you.